Agonistics and Far Left Populism and All Else She Wrote by Chantal Mouf is the topic for today's chat, which mm-hmm. will hopefully be a little bit shorter than last week's, last fortnight's, last times, mm-hmm. the last one. Um, you got it? Did you want to kick off with or anything? Um, I guess not, because I guess, I mean, we're going to be moving our way slowly into on the left populism. That's that's um, the main focus, yeah. Which is the main focus. Um, so I, I'd imagine, yeah, I'll have a little bit more experience with that book rather than uh, ag- agonistics. Ag- ag- agonistics. Right. Was it agonistics? Yeah. Um, it is agonistics. <laughs> so yeah, I, agonistics. Uh, so yeah, no, I'd imagine I'll pick up a bit more of them, but no. Um, yeah, I think because, because um, for left populism is the main focus, uh, I had hoped to have a, to have like a collapsed conceptual framework for the previous four books. Um, mm-hmm. So actually, I mentioned this in, I think, the last video or one of the last videos that... Um, me and Ollie had done some previous chats for a smaller community, smaller than YouTube, potentially smaller community because YouTube is a potentially larger community. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did, uh, we, we, we kicked things off with, um, with four chats uh, dedicated to one of the four chapters of Black Lion Moves, Hegemony and Social Strategy. And um because this this initiative had started as a as a bit of a book club, um, but we've 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 tr- we've decided to try try doing this, try to extend it uh, beyond being a book club for a smaller community and trying to apply the um the things in the books to a wider context and to to, to chat a bit like about wider, wider practical things, I guess, rather than just strictly talk about books. Anyway, so, um, like I said, Far Left Populism, written in 2018, or published in 2018, um, is the focus, but as context, uh, background context, between hegemony and social strategy and Far Left Populism, um, Social strategy was 1985, um, populism was 2018, and so I think between 1993 and 2013, so 20 years, um, she wrote four other books. Uh, return? That's all we call it. Return of the politics. Uh, re- a return to politics. To politics. Or return, return to politics, politics. The democratic uh, paradox on the political, and then agonistics. So I think like um, her, uh, other than her effort with Laclau, uh, her seminal um, book or her seminal maybe concept is agonistics. Okay. Um. And the three return paradox and on the, which is our shorthand, um, sort of lead up to that. And it's over those 20 years, it's an interesting development, a little bit slow, because obviously with um, her treatment of populism, or not her treatment of populism actually, but her sort of call to populism in 2018 is sort of a, a radical departure from from the previous her previous perspectives um because in hegemony and social strategy they they do talk about populism but they they sort of um they talk about it as being distinct to their hegemonic um pluralistic uh struggle towards radical democracy because you need a you need a social field that exists of two camps, the us and the them, but it, but in a very delineated way. So if you imagine in um, like a a, a a not a developing 
country maybe where sort of where nationalism or where the nation state and the idea of nation has been sort of implanted and um you sort of imagine um local populations have had this foisted upon them this this new modern way of um organizing society and uh uh, uh alongside the uh, a colonial history of um having their resources and people um taken <laughs> and um uh, not 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 being in not not having the best sort of material conditions to sort of rapidly um assimilate these new ideas and new ways of being and you just got an An, an elite, a, a section of society, a small section of society that comes to become quite quickly the elite because of whatever opportunity, whatever time and place they were in. Mm-hmm. Um, and they just get to take advantage of it and subjugate the entire rest of the social field uh, to their incompetence and greed. Um, and again, this is still hypothetical. And uh, the you can quite quickly get a, a, a populist movement against this situation. Um, there's very little sort of room to breathe in terms of the antagonisms that that society, the imminence of that antagonism, sort of takes supremacy in their in their society. Whereas um, hegemony social strategy, they're talking about the 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 plurality of subject positions and the need to form chains of equivalence between them in order to mount a democratic hegemonic strategy rather than a populist hegemonic strategy Mm -hmm. or project. Uh, That's the distinction. However, Mm -hmm. they do caveat that with it's really only a matter of scale. Um, There's no, there's no real substantial difference um, between a country with two camps and any other smaller collection of people with a common grievance and an antagonistic frontier with a target on the other side of that that they're blaming for that um, grievance. It's just a matter of scale. There's there's no real difference. Um, so I suppose the explicit um, adoption of a populist movement is contextualized uh, in the now, and we'll get to why when we get to that um but first yeah like i had started off saying i had hoped to do a sort of a a collapsed treatment of the four books or at least the three books that would lead to an agonistics which would then lead to populism um but we've sort of run out of time again haven't we Mm -hmm. which is which is our thing Mm. um so and it was, I think it was a while when we were doing this. This was sort of autumn, wasn't it? When we were looking at these books. And I think... Yeah. Yeah, it was going a good bit back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wish, I wish I had it sort of more clearly in my head. But from what I can remember, um, there's a huge amount of crossover um, in terms of moves, references, um, you know who who's who's inspiring her sort of her concepts um in both positively and negatively and um it's interesting because it starts it starts off and i think i think Zizek was a big sort of um pointed this out it starts off almost or she starts off almost as a, a, a liberal apologist, uh, which is really strange for for a, a post-Marxist radical democratic. Um, but in the return of the political, um, it's quite a. There's a lot of defence um, for liberalism, which which through her through the 20 years you can sort of see erode and it wasn't a focus in 1985 so much um but you but yeah you see you see that you see this stance develop and um and like while while she's always like fighting for 
a deepening of democracy. Um, it's the European tradition of liberal democracy that she's defending and arguing against the um, the radical break from, which obviously uh, more revolutionary stances would would uh, argue for. Um, so, in defending liberal democracy, and I'll explain sort of her take on that as we go. Um, she, yeah, she yeah she comes across as like um, yeah a, a, a liberal apologist, <laughs> really. But like, of course, I think um, I think a point on that is is important, and you know, you, you don't need move to to appreciate that point. The we're all we're all we we're all born of the European Enlightenment tradition and a and a specific conception of the individual that we are told is distinct to to other historic locations and their conception of the individual and um excuse me and um um it it's not that it's not that that's it then that's we 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 accept that and uh and we should um form our societies around that conception but at mm-hmm. the same time it is something that needs to be considered in in um developing and outlining uh political strategies um out of respect if nothing else but also strategically um it's it's key because you know if you don't want to be a dickhead you gotta you gotta <laughs> sort of um other people gotta be happy with what what you're doing mm. uh, and and a third reason that um there are i assume generally speaking there are there are elements that people not universally but there are elements that people would sort of agree on in terms of keeping like uh I want to wear my orange t-shirt today and you want to wear your brown cardigan and stuff like that. Mm. That sort of thing is cool. Um, But obviously not to the extent that where we substitute choice for democracy, which has happened and which of course Chantal Mouffe recognizes and argues against. Mm. So I think in one of the other videos I said that they might not, like Leon Move might not necessarily be anti-capitalist, but actually, of course, they are. It's just that they're, they are, I, I, I want to say reformist, gradualist, uh, but actually, at some stage in these books, Move uh, argues against the revolutionary or reformist dichotomy. Yeah, I think um, she has a very, a very defined like. Uh, I think she defines the sort of r- various reformist stances, I guess, in I think three different types, maybe two or three different types of reformism. Um, and I think, yeah, it's it's the it's interesting to hear that the idea of liberalism has kind of continued all the way through the books. Because, and I'd like I'd, this is why I'd really like to go back and read. Uh, some of the books before um, populist left or left populism simply because I've gone sort of from the eighties directly into, I guess that point that you mentioned where uh, her, I guess she's kind of maybe coming to the, the main point of what it is she wants or sees as worthwhile still kind of maintaining or I don't want to say extracting because I, I mean, I, I think that sounds kind of like she's, she's kind of picking bones of what she wants. I think it's what's, what's uh, worthwhile of main, like holding onto and deepening and progressing with from the liberal um, standpoint, I guess, which is, as you pointed out, like this kind of, you know, you, uh, European liberal democratic background. Yeah. Um, so it'd be interesting to see that slowly whittled away, I guess. Um, the it like obviously the the context is dead important in the time of writing as mm-hmm. well. I think mm-hmm. nineteen eighty five um, 
let's assume arbitrarily that they were they began work on that in at the in 1980 say um and that's they've just had experience of the late 60s through the 70s and um the immense proliferation at that time of new social movements must have been quite phenomenal for for political philosophists Mm. Um, then sort of 93 you've you've got I mean Clinton Clinton is ju- just in Paris so like sort of the third way might, may not necessarily have been fully apparent but of course um, what's his face their academic dude Jesus not North. Giddens. Giddens. I think Anthony Giddens. Um, so he he was he did write his sort of um, treaties on the Third Way in in the late eighties. So there would have been the intellectual like um, groundings. You you could have see well you wouldn't necessarily known it was going to go all the way to Blair Blairism, but. Um, the, the the noise was there of where neoliberalism was going to go um and where the left was going to go the left left the left and all that um and i think then by paradox the uh, her second book blair was in 3 years and um it was a big deal and um 2005 was on the political and you know so the return of history had happened at that stage um um you know uh, 9-11 war on terror george bush um also the the anti-capitalist movement of the turn of the millennium would have been apparent there um i'm trying to remember when antonio or well hart and negri were writing um because i think they were i, I never read hart and negri but um i always got the impression from other authors that they attempted what what their books attempted to do or their intellectual project attempted to do was to sort of um encapsulate the anti capitalist anti-globalist movement of the um of the noughties god mm-hmm. hey just thinking this the other day just as an aside the noughties such a lame name and then we have the teens or whatever the tens we, we we're in the 20s now that's cool mm-hmm. you can say that man. not the cringe anyway um yeah the noughties was pretty bad oh what a name I just mm. i hate saying the noughties but <laughs> The, um, <laughs> so I think they 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 were attempting to yeah uh, the, you know they they were writing about like a political exodus and uh, Moof takes huge homage to this, saying God no we need political political engagement for fuck's sake. But yeah, I mean basically they were they were sort of an intellectual attempt at encapsulating anarchism, I suppose. Okay, uh, so they were they were calling for. I guess what we'll get into later is like the sort of revolutionary break or revolutionary reform, like spontaneous revolution. Yeah. So to move away from the current democratic institutions that were, or yeah, current or then current democratic institutions, how things were working. And then, you know, to, to rather than dig your heels in, I suppose, and try to an attempt at least at some kind of, uh, you know, re-democratizing or whatever <laughs> or deepening of oh yeah big uh, time it's, it's it's it was a revolutionary break away from that okay all right it, it was like um like that book that wasn't an intellectual intervention um amazing book though um we are every written by we are everywhere or notes from nowhere when well, the book was called we are everywhere by notes from nowhere or by no one or something like that and um just a collection of stories of 
of the grassroots movements around around the uh, the world at that time. You know, kicking off with with San Cristobal in '94, and and obviously okay. Seattle was the the the, the when it entered the white world yeah. <laughs> and, and the whole movement kicked off then the mentioned already um in previous chats the um the one million people of the anti Iraq war in London and all all that sort of stuff just Bush really was uh, painted himself or be, was painted as the sort of poster boy for anti globalization and th- the whole like new concept of empire and Hart Negri's book was one of their books was called Empire. It was just a sort of oh, okay. a deterritorialized conception of like a cultural hegemonic situation. I don't know. Did they use hegemony? But that's what it was. Um, anyway, the point is that um, her books are always written in historic context, and her what she's defending, and I suppose the overarching point is that back in nineteen ninety three. She didn't know what was coming. Uh, she didn't know the extent of the third way of um, of not only did sort of neoliberalism scotch social democracy at the end of the seventies, but it by Blair and Clinton through the nineties, neoliberalism had instituted social liberalism, um, capitalism with a smile. And you know she she was she wasn't to know that when she was like defending liberalism and mm-hmm. to the extent that she was um, early on and come the end of of her um, the last two books basically two thousand thirteen two thousand eighteen you know and particularly in two thousand and eighteen she's she's saying oh yeah <laughs> this yeah. we've th- there there is an enormous overdetermination in liberal democracy by the liberal element and um, to the to the grave detriment of the democratic um, aspect of our society. And this needs to be rectified. So, um, I mean, actually, I guess we can just go straight into what the hell does agonistics mean? So my understanding of mus agonistics, um, and I think did she start talking about this in return? Actually, because I did, I did get halfway through return um, before I t- before I jumped over to the left. Did she, or, or had she already at least started to contextualize um, in return to politics? where we sort of had to go, I guess, I guess it's the argument not for the, or at least starting to conceive of the argument for not the revolutionary break, but moving back towards, I guess, the idea or how the party, I suppose, could be in reinvigorated or re-energized um, in, within, I guess, politics. And I guess this is moving towards the idea of the formation of an us, an, an articulation rather of an us, and them, um, and a political fr- or a frontier, I guess, I sort of envision it as, you know, two poles and a frontier in between, which I suppose is the discursive or the discourse. Yeah. Um, uh, the agonistics, uh, the agonistic element, um, I suppose that due to the um, sort of, I suppose, vast kind of multiplicity of consist, um, constantly kind of developing new, um, I suppose, social movements, um, subject positions, um, there would be consecutively evolving antagonisms between, uh, I suppose, you know, various poles, but not necessarily, you know, in between different I suppose there's constant forming of an us and them. I, lo- I love um, your I love your stack of poles. It's like that game with all the sticks, the needles. Oh, pick up, pick up sticks. Pick up sticks. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. imagine when you. Sorry, this is it, it's it's just it's, no, a, it's a hang up because it's where oh. it's where it's how I visualized yeah, it while yeah, reading. So this is how it's always happened. Um, it's just yeah. So it's really within vi- this sort vibrating of, pile of sticks. Really. Yeah. Angry. So I guess. <laughs> Go on. Sorry. <laughs> just, 
Um, so yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's the way I sort of envisioned it from, from her description would be, yeah. So because of this, you know, it's, it wasn't, uh, or yeah, the things had progressed on to become, yeah, no longer just a, I guess a, I don't know if it's calling it a, a hard us and them, which would, I suppose, have been what they were maybe talking about from, I guess, the essentialist kind of perspective, mm-hmm. or I suppose, you know, from a strict worker and capitalist perspective this wasn't the case anymore it was varied beyond anything that anyone could have imagined and continues to grow i suppose in that regard um so the yeah the antagonisms are constantly being reproduced between i guess the sticks but also you know but you know as as a as a large sort of thatch i guess of these sticks or poles rather they're not mm-hmm. sticks they're poles sorry. um <laughs> sorry now i've just got target i'm i'm keep going to, towards the tree um <laughs> so um so sorry to to round that off though this idea of agonism i guess um would be to uh artic- articulating I, I am i right in understanding it as like within this articulation of an an us which is the i guess a universal us yeah um via chains of equivalence uh between these different social movements and different subject positions and, and you know di- uh, di- this diversity of groups and, and and individuals um by creating a sort of universal i suppose suffrage or struggle or 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 a uni- asking a universal question or articulating a universal struggle at a them yeah um but not necessarily making it an enemy to be because this is one thing i think she started talking about in return if i'm not if i'm correct this idea of not seeing them as an enemy to be vanquished but political yeah. adversaries would um to be debated to enter into a discourse with to be, I suppose, overcome with hegemonically. That. Hegemonically. Um, I don't know if there's any. I don't know if I missed all of it or if I missed some of it. No, no. Uh, um, it's it's the you've you've couched it in right. in uh, in in the hegemonic um, lens, and okay. you know, there's like if just outside the hegemonic lens, it's mm-hmm. it's it the like and you've said it already it's the um it's just just the the enmetic relationship so that's that's antagonistic um and like you said uh in some in some sort of antagonistic relationships there is a will to to vanquish the um the other uh in in a hard us and them Mm-hmm. And um, moves moves idea on on that sort of simple uh, stripped down in that simple stripped down sense is just to arrive at a at a a politics that allows for as you said the um, the discursive sort of treatment of antagonisms um, mm-hmm. um, to see instead of the other as an enemy to see it as an adversary um and i think the reason that like she became so sort of hardline come 2013 that produced this book even though like you like you were saying like it, it does feature in the other in the previous books but this is like she's really trying to hammer this this point home at this stage is that um since the third way politics um and, and this is this is capitalist realism. Um, consensus was the was the mantra. Um, yeah. um, and this, she argues, eliminates the uh, the possibility of legitimate dissent. So this mm-hmm. is sort of like what what your what where, where you were going from the from the simple from the simple stripped down version to the hegemonic um, situation. That you were couching it in, um, in in the historic situation then of the nineties and the noughties, um, yeah, we, the, the third way eliminated the possibility of legitimate dissent, um, which leads to sort of the revival of 
and like violent antagonisms. So I think I think Moof mentions the um, the sort of the youth, the not the youth movements, but the youth ruptures, the sort of supposedly senseless outbursts of violence by urban youths in London and Paris uh, ten sure. years ago or so. The Lachine fame. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um this is the result of um having no political avenue to express those grievances um mm-hmm. because of consensus and and capitalist realism concealing um concealing the possibility the legitimate possibility to do so so it's like um there's an element of capitalist realism that that uh, and I think this is directly from Fisher's book um you know that uh that seeks to that seeks to uh, tag belief as mental illness you know so like religion or anything meaning if you, if you if you if you have anything that means something to you you're vulnerable and you're weak and you're pathetic and uh hmm. and you're mentally ill essentially and there's yeah, no need I'm, for that no exactly it's it's uh, i guess in a way as well, it's it's why I always tend to cringe, even though I don't count myself as necessarily being a particularly spiritual person. Uh, it's always that one that one response people say when uh, you're hearing a group of people discussing perhaps a, a relative or a friend that's religious, and someone will usually kind of squint and go, "Well, you know, if you need that in your life, I suppose it's fine." Or it's usually like a not you know some nice people need yeah some that's that's fine you know if that's what you need or if that i guess the the term would be you know whatever helps you sleep at night kind of thing but it's always seen as um an as you said it's kind of seen as an uh yeah like a need there's always an element of need a you can't get by on your own you're not able to just handle your shit basically you, there's always got to be something that you're logging your struggle or personal yeah. or whatever issues you're having oh don't you see a therapist i i pay for my crutch yeah exactly yours is free at a church with loads of other poor people (laughs) jesus yeah Yeah. it's like you get you get to sing jesus (laughs) i mean like i just have to sit on that couch the whole time (laughs) sounds better Mm. and it's free (laughs) well unless they're pressuring you into giving yeah. them all your money yeah but they're all together oh that's true I mean, they don't need they're money. all together it, i mean yeah if they were doing it on facebook it'd be different <laughs> like a sort of skype into church kind of thing which i'm sure exists yeah it's just <laughs> the possibilities and then oh yeah it's definitely there yeah, it probably is yeah jokes jokes take you so far um so yeah sorry where were that's we? right uh, uh, well at that point was sort of wrapped up with the um where i was going to go with it was the sort of um um what lies behind that idea so it's it's kind of you can say it on that level and it seems to make sense but um the sort of the bigger philosophical is it even yeah maybe philosophical um sort of conversation underpinning that is um or branching off from that conversation is this this uh, this idea of of and we've touched on it before, but like totality, and the, the social, the social total. So, say you're a, a young revolutionary and you write your you scribble out your manifesto, and this vision um, of this manifesto is, you know, the product of your empirical experiences mixed with your sense of justice, um, and you know, you're not going to write a manifesto unless, of course, it's something that can be applied outside your own self because otherwise the way you live is your manifesto. Um, sure. But, of course, the way you live is your only authentic source of of empirical experience of society. Mm. And, um, you know, the further you go from yourself, the sort of... the the lower the fidelity uh, of your grasp of 
society becomes um so the the, le- the less applicable your manifesto sort of can become as well uh, and also um the less um the less possibly relevant your sense of justice becomes because obviously your your sense of justice is determined by you, your sort of um your empirical experience like um you know um a, a man a man sort of experience of injustice is going to be entirely different to a woman's uh mm, the same absolutely. along um race and gender uh, race and sexuality and mm. um this so so the sense of the totality of society um anyone anyone that attempts to to draw up a manifesto it, it is sort of claiming in the first instance that they've got a decent grasp of this society but of course um you know that that led to the the grand narratives um up to 100 years ago um and since then you know the the terrain of undecidability has expanded and we've questioned everything and we're so far from god now and god sure we don't even we we don't even have faith in our own rationality anymore um who the fuck knows what's happening yeah. and the theory of the impossibility of that social totality is like a is a sort of an underpinning keystone an underpinning keystone underpinning. of <laughs> of um of postmodern sort of thought and um uh, basically there's always a gap there's always a gap between how we articulate the world or how we sense and communicate how or how we communicate how we sense the world and that actual world uh this is this is lacan's real that resists um the symbolic so we can attempt to symbolize communicate the this this world this empirical real that we experience but it will never be a full enough articulation a full enough representation of what's really there and um and because we come away from that moment to to a moment between us and say oh my god i just saw or felt or blah 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 but already what i'm saying isn't grasping the essence of that real sure so um yeah i think is it then just because, yeah, I struggled, I struggled actually with the Lacan and the real for quite a while, actually, even going through, yeah, our earlier readings of um, capitalist realism. And it, it, it did give me, but uh, eventually I think when I'd finally kind of had the mirror phase of the, the idea kind of hammered into me by enough different <laughs> resources. Mm. Um, yeah. So I guess, yeah, just to, sort of have it out in my head just in case there's something I've missed from it. This idea that, yeah, we will struggle inevitably to be able to, I guess, articulate whether it's a moment or a sense of being um, authentically or or there will be a worry also that we will be constantly inauthentically or unable to articulate it to say from me to you, my sense of being or my experience of something Mm my understanding of something because how you also perceive me is different to how I will perceive myself. And if I can't articulate my self, my sense of being or my experiences to you authentically, because there's this blockage, I suppose that is always how you're experiencing, I guess the fear or worry, is it that the idea that there will always be this blockage of how you're experiencing me or taking in, my experiences so to speak will always have an air of i don't don't, i don't even know is it a blockage because it's like um i don't know what interaction or um interface this is but like there's something like on a phone or whatever that if you touch it it disperses like in a sort of a schrodinger's cat sort of sense but like already what you're describing there just between two people dialogue between two people the sort of field the field of um, of subjectivities multiplies. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's probably a much easier way to to describe it, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, but rather than the blockage, 
I mean, so yeah, the, sorry. So there's there's a barrier there, yeah. Uh, a, a blockage. Sorry, too. I think I would have meant barrier rather than I guess blockage. But e- even still, it's just it's the, what the barrier is is just our ability to grasp, in a total sense, like to to become objective to our dialogue, to mm-hmm. to see that field of like dis dispersing meaning and subjectivity is like like the different sort of. I mean, you, you just put it there, uh, but you wouldn't understand what I was saying, uh, sort of thing, even though you're speaking the same language. Um, but even at that, even between those two points, attempting to like a, like a, a dyadic dialogue, um, the internal identities of each of those individuals might interpret at any given moment that dialogue in an entirely different way. So it just exactly. bifurcates in a, in a sort of like mm. a, a near infinite um situation and th- okay. but this this gap between the real and um and our our articulation of it i guess um is where the sort of the radical negativity lies and i just threw that in there like as if i had said it already um the radical negativity is the is so we the reason i brought this up was because in the previous point uh we were talking about um these antagonisms mm-hmm. and um so sure, why why are why are there these antagonisms so hegemonian socialist strategy was written as a as a sort of um before before neoliberalism had really taken off like i said before the social liberal element the third way the uh, the left leaving the left um blair and clinton before all of that but totally relevant to that um they wrote that book as a critique of tr- the traditional left not the not the new left um that would come to be um and that was because the traditional left um due to Marx's hegemonic position within that, um, or Marx's doctrine, um, rather than the man himself, that sought to describe and achieve a social totality, as if it could possibly do so. And this is the difference between modern concept of society and and the postmodern concept. So, So 100 years ago, or, or roughly speaking hey you know the 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 concepts um or the 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 trend in thinking started to um started to sort of appreciate the the context rather than the content of something i think is an a decent way of putting it okay. um and this idea of the impossibility of the universal of of, of conceiving of society of, of of touching the real um came to be and in hegemony and social strategy um the critique is that okay you can attempt to reconcile your articulation or your conception with the real but because it'll because it'll always be an artificial bridging of the gap between those two things. Um, there'll always be a violence and there will always be suppression. Uh-huh. And what both the old, the traditional left and the new left came to do, uh, well, the new left was the one that came to do it. Um, I mean, I suppose there's arguments that the traditional left did it as well in, in, um, in some communist instances. Um, though I'd probably argue against that if I could, but not here, um, is that that stretch is 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 um, is where authoritarianism is instituted. Is because you're demanding that your vision of the real is a universal situation and it must be accepted, and in so doing, you um, immediately exclude anyone who disagrees with you and 
and what capitalist realism is is the attempt to um is the attempt to to combat th- those that would disagree with that suturing of reality that sewing together neatly of the ideology and the reality um and any 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 technique or method to suppress the possibility of dissent um the whatever power at, is at hand to do so um and and to in, that act is is obviously a totalitarianism it's it's an attempt to totalize society and um but because that gap exists there's a radical negativity you will you will never you will never institute here back to the boy with his manifesto he will never no matter how no matter how close he gets to hitler or Mussolini, he'll never actually bridge that gap and will have to become a Hitler or Mussolini to, to if even for a moment, stabilize that vision in society, the amount of suppression that's needed. And, um, yeah, radical, radical negativity. Um, every, time, every time the horizon is, is brought, is sort of, is neared then antagonisms will just flare up it makes sense like if i start telling you how something is you'll immediately go now go fuck yourself yeah so that's basically radical negativities right there i should have said that from the start (laughs) (laughs) um so this that that's um yeah the the impossibility of arriving at a total at a total society and um this is always uh, always antagonism, and so uh, this this is where this is where the sort of the idea of contingency comes from. Um, that any given moment that does suture the totality is a is a con- as a contingent articulation, um, be- literally because one. A, a sort of a, a a unitarily sourced vision implemented at a near universal scale um mm-hmm. because that will always derive or because antagonisms will always derive from such a, a feat um it's it's always there that order is always contingent just in the mere in the mere act or in the mere existence of um contestation so it's it's one person's word against another and if that one person somehow utilizes power to 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 hegemonize to amass like to to assemble the resources to enact that vision uh-huh because any other given person who who is in a relationship of struggle with that power um, and disagrees, hence the struggle, um, their vision is just as valid. And and this is this is sort of this idea of radical negativity gives way to uh, to any given order being seen as contingent. Uh, the quote is: "Things could always be otherwise," and so antagonism or agonism because of this contingency that it's a hegemonic um situation we have the choice to to identify those generating or instituting that hegemonic situation and uh destroy seek to destroy them and implement Mm -hmm. implement our own as if to assume that that was correct and to totally ignore the radical negativity and the um the impossible the impossibility of the real um or to to sort of partake and mutually generate a political situation that allows for an agonistic relationship where where just for the sake of simplicity, where both parties um, recognize 
th- each other's right to attempt to institute their vision. Uh-huh. And at the same time, their identity is split between that vision, that opposing vision, but also the protection of the other's right. So, like I said, for simplicity's sake, there's two parties in the society. And um, they've both got a split identity. The first identity is in their own vision. The second identity is in the system that, and the system equates to protecting the right of the other person to possess and articulate their vision. And they've got a radical democratic hegemonic struggle at infinitum because every time, and, and you know, it becomes complex then and becomes, ra- it, the reason it becomes radical radical is because once you, once the, um, the subject positions disperse infinitely, once they arrive, once, once a totality is arrived at hegemonically, um, a new, new descent, you know, comes out of that act they then have the right to um, to mount their own hegemonic their counter hegemonic um struggle if that makes sense and so this and i know what we've said before privately this is the sort of the lava lamp ah okay yeah so as, as soon as the sort of the wax in the lava lamp congeals into a solid state there's always a current through it of molten wax that's about to change the shape and it's in a constant flux even though that constant flux can be broken down into moments of consolidated stasis mm. with with an internal dynamism and a, a continuously in flux um form mm-hmm. yeah so that's that equivalence does not negate difference oh yeah yeah so actually just returning to return so the, the, I think this might have been the first point she makes in her in her standalone books. Mm-hmm. Um, universalism, because uh, down the line in these chats, the the universal and the particular will will take its own focus. But it's important to point this out. Her la, her her first point: um, universalism is not to be rejected, but to be particularized. Um, critique of. Yeah, 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 you just leave it there. Uh, so, so that that sort of the importance of that will become apparent because um, because of course hegemonian social strategy is is and and this idea of radical negativity is sort of like a like a an attack on on the idea of the universal. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, not to be rejected, particularized. So, excuse me. Equivalence, yeah, equivalence doesn't negate difference. Um, we need a we and a they for the politics, um, for political hegemonic engagement. Um, nodal points should be established in war position. And um, yeah, total society is impossible, always antagonisms. So I think that's, um, I think that's, the root of those points actually is is something is 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 a critique of Hart and Negri, uh, like I well I touched on already, um, but this idea of equivalence not negating difference, um, the chain of equivalence in hegemonic and social strategy, um, the, and I think we'll get onto examples of that a bit more in next chat, uh, but it's just briefly it's the. <laughs> for each given or in each given moment uh, where there are antagonisms the subject positions will of course identify with their grievance Um, but in a hegemonic articulation when a hegemonic project attempts to articulate itself as a movement in hegemonic and social strategy as a as a as a political movement, a democratic movement, um, but in um, in her later work as as a populist movement, um, the identity of that movement, uh, the, the 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 subject position, is split between itself, like 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 in the last tract, um, but but not in terms of antagonism, um, 
but in terms of not in terms of difference, but in terms of equivalence, actually, in their words. Split between the original position, but also with the position of the empty signifier that um, that comes to um, encapsulate the the what's that term the the essence of of the movement. Um, so here it's 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 the particularizing of the universal. So it's not necessarily like a hegemonic articulation and a chain of equivalence. A popular movement of the left uh, in terms of Lachlan Mouffe's position isn't, I mean, it is a universal. It's a, it's a universal movement, as universal as, as it can possibly get. You know, it, it will strive to, they're not against getting a, a big popular movement everyone together you know like a, a, a class society in 99 percent or whatever not a class society but a class movement uh, their only issue is that traditional versions modern pre-postmodern um, conceptions of this and not naive not naive with respect to their time and place but certainly sort of naive to our time and place, naively um, assumed that that society could be the real and the rhetorical, I suppose, could be uh, reconciled, that we could conceive of society to the point that we could, with high faith in ourselves, enact our vision. Okay. And, everyone, and everyone would be happy. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't need, we could, we could get to a post-political situation, communism. Um, universal global communism everyone would be happy but of course that wouldn't be the case but but before that point in getting in getting to a movement um, the universal can exist the class subject inverted commas can exist as long as it isn't determined by something like class in the traditional or sense Oh, okay, or determined, I suppose, by, uh, I guess, is in saying, you know, the idea that um, uh, what they were saying about how equivalence um, doesn't negate difference and this idea of particularization, is it also in saying, yeah, it doesn't, as long as the, I guess, the universal or the class subject or what was the term you sorry class subject or class identity no class subject yeah yeah the class subject isn't defined or articulated as i mean my reading of that would have been book. yeah my my reading of that would have been within this you know within this hegemonic block you will have a one would assume a myriad of different subject positions and in so different grievance uh, a myriad of different grievances various struggles um the coming together of the universal or what i'm guess i think you refer to as like the high faith like if i'm reading that as the same sort of thing like the the signifier i suppose the traditional um, the high um, faith was like a like like say an orthodox or class classical marxist feeling that they knew enough about the world to demand the level of fealty and identity from a proletariat that constituted the class subject that there couldn't be any there wasn't anything else there was only economism and there was only oh, okay. this this pathway this doctrine so that's what i meant by high faith that they had enough oh, faith okay. right. in that doctrine that this was what to do sorry go on hmm. but um, your point probably stood alone beyond that. yeah so i mean i guess so i guess yeah my reading of it would be yeah this my rate of different this various struggles and subject positions um the coming together in one in in a universal it doesn't negate the fact that they have this, you know, this sort of plethora of, of various struggles, I suppose, which is like struggles and grievances, which they will, you know, people will obviously identify with, but I guess just not to say identify on such a strong level that it, I guess, attempts to articulate the universal. I guess that that's the, that's where the strategy, I suppose, comes into it's, it's finding a, a universal or an empty signifier universal 
I guess, <laughs> actually, you know, that's a, that's a good universally. I mean, that's just, I mean, that would be my, that was my initial reading of it, but it could be that it's just a little bit less, maybe without some of the, the backbone, I guess, or the meat, I guess, of the other books. Um, you know, it was my reading of that, the, yeah, just that, that, that equivalence that will be formed within the, I guess, the fractured, <laughs> the, the equivalent that we will use to, re, I suppose, re, reform the fractured. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Reform the fractures or, or create a connective tissue doesn't negate within the universal their, the individual grievances or the individual struggles of these various groups. Whereas it actually, it's, it's, it's the strategy in that is that coming together of, fight, of attempting the universal um, that is able to, I suppose, account for all these things or embody or hold all these things in the same net, so to speak. I don't know. Maybe that's a terrible metaphor. For no, it. no, no, that, that, that works. A basket, whichever. The, um, <laughs> the, it seems intuitive to us, um, I suppose, coming from like that anarchist community. Um, We've talked on this before, I think. Yeah, yeah that w- it, like you know, we recognise the the importance of um, affinity groups and aut- autonomous um, groups, and um, but but the, the potentiality for them to find a common um, a commonality and come together and act together and coordinate. And mm. so, I think. I think um, we've does touch touch on this and sort of um, claims that there was never and to be honest, that's sort of Hart and Negri's uh, thing as well. Um, just without the the sort of the hegemonic engagement uh, that mm-hmm. we're sort of touching on now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's 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 a coming together of both. But like Moof, we've talked about um, grassroots. Uh, initiatives in uh, agonistics and sort of critiques them for having a lack of focus. So, uh, like I remember in two thousand and one, um, and she mentions these this this instance in the book. But I remember in two thousand and one when um, the the Argentinian peso kept collapsing, and they went they went through a series of governments, but like grassroots movements, like just continuously demanded um, the end of whatever given government and. I just remember it being amazing because the whole community would take to the streets and reappropriate all the businesses like that, you know, cause obviously if, if, if the play, if the economy's in shutdown and civil disobedience, the city, the town's in shutdown, um, you know, people need to eat. So they fucking get up and they start working for themselves, uh, hmm. collectivizing and, um, running through cooperatives, the bakery and whatever other necessities, um, there were at hand whatever resources and um but she did, dismisses these because ultimately uh society went on um you know a government came and stabilized the the status quo eventually and the the, the movement never came to something so she contrasts that with um the may 15th god i can't remember the the spanish are the indignados yes i'm probably saying that very wrong um, <laughs> better than better than I could. So I think I think she. Um, I think I can't quite remember. Um, I, I brushed I, like I glanced over these one, the, the this bit. I remember reading it. I just didn't look at the notes basically this time around because I didn't think we'd be touching on it. But um, that it was either that or Shariza maybe. But basically, it attached itself or a party attached itself to a, a grassroots movement and allowed for a focus to have impact on a wider scale. So now. To me, both instances lead to the continuation of the status quo. Um, however, both instances also have the potential to um, continue to connect with other similar movements and network. And while they didn't in those instances, or I mean, Spain is ongoing, obviously, that socialist government at the moment is a result of this, right? The Indignados. Oh, I mean, uh, what, uh, well, yeah, I mean, but, yeah, but they must, yeah, I mean, yeah. they 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 came out of that movement, yeah. So, um, so there, the effect, the effect of um, of of that moment, mm. um, is yet to be known. But obviously, I mean, Shariza, it seems quite 
a dead duck. Um, so regardless of the focus, it's it's not great. So I don't, I don't think Moof's point is is entirely valid there uh, to to discount the what happened in Argentina. So anyway, yeah, while it's while it's, while it's intuitive to us, and the the potentiality of radically coming together is there, you I think articulate it uh, quite interestingly the difference between I suppose articulating a universal as 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 an empty signifier actually rather than uh, the means rather than the ends. So that's a big distinction. So say like a traditional Marxist would see communism as as that final totality, that post-political situation that like homogenized society mm-hmm. where antagonisms or any, antag- any antagonisms that arise just aren't important enough to consider politically. I guess mm-hmm. that's the thing, which is, you know, sort of essentially um, what, what, what neoliberalism did as well. Uh, that's a different thing to institute the universal uh, on the basis of the privileged class subjective um, where you're making demands for a final closed suturing of society is totally different to the opening of an already instituted hegemonic suture, say that of neoliberalism or capitalism even. Um, and through, through a discourse of the universal. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? So there's like yeah, a huge yeah. difference. So mm. you, like if you close something, if you close it with the universal, then you're, you're either an incredibly successful authoritarian or everyone's just going to die in civil war. Uh, but if you're opening an already closed suture through the idea, the myth, maybe this is Sorrow here, his general strike myth, like general strikes mm. won't do anything, but they'll at least maintain the working class identity as distinct to the um, owners of production. Um, sure, sure. So, so that that, poten- that radical potential is there for the universal. And yeah, like I said, Mouffe says, um, it doesn't need to be rejected. It just needs to be particularized. And as you were saying, that seems quite intuitive to us. Mm. She finishes. Whoops, let's go. <laughs> she finishes. Um, uh, uh, there's a need for a multi-front struggle, uh, including, yeah, so yeah, including key uh, existing institutions, not an exodus. Um, okay. Violence is due to a lack of uh, agonistic avenues. Neoliberalism replaces equality with choice and... Uh, representative democracy can be, I think she ends the book with that point, representative democracy can be retaken. Um, so, uh, that, I mean, okay. th- there's, there's sort of points there that can be gotten into, but... Um, mm. But I mean, that, that's, it follows into left populism, populism. quite heavily, yeah. Um, Interesting. So the, the, one, the one before I was going to get into it, the one thing I was going to touch on was... Um, agonistics and art but um, I think maybe we should just go into left populism um, or, I mean I mean you've you've brought this up actually I mean I'm assuming are you alluding to the the artic the articulate or maybe not the articulation sorry uh, the idea of an art and critique movement is that what yeah, you're referring to pretty much. I mean we've talked a little bit about this off off chats I, I, I think we um, I think we did bring it up in the in the first chat actually with Stephen <laughs> Um, or the second chat with us i can't remember it was brought up though in yeah but again if this is uh yeah i mean i'd I'd like to expand a little bit more on it just because again after not really having too much of an eye on uh some of the stuff in these books i i found that this point has been quite interesting it's played a bit of a part in in yeah at least one of our last chats so yeah i think yeah google the google thing it was it was the last chat oh absolutely (laughs) the socialist google or whatever (laughs) it was yeah Cool. Um, yeah, no, let's, 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 let's dig into it again. Well, she makes the point. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the points briefly. There's just on, cool. there's like three. Mm. Uh, art can be a, a field of hegemonic confrontation where we conceive of the world um, and communicate um, it 
uh, leading to new subjectivities and diffusing of a new common sense. And then public space is symbolically ordered, hegemonically determined. That's, that's the essence of the chapter and her points, uh, okay. which we can obviously elaborate. Mm. Any thoughts? Um, I'm interested to hear more about, because I think the, the first... I guess the first statement uh, with a, that's the regards Google one. to that's the Google one. Yeah, it's it's something I'd like to try and expand a bit more on just to get a better get a, get a bit more of the breadth and width of this thing. It's Doug Lane's video, isn't it, or uh, an aspect of it? Um, uh, the 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 Jameson critique that uh, culturally we are c- culture cultural production is colonized by uh, nostalgia. Um, what as consumers in neoliberalism what we're what we're consuming culturally is is always um a harking back to an authentic real from the past mm-hmm. um which is a really clever way um for a, a hegemon to to distort the the discursive pathways um, that could lead to their status being challenged. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like if thing with Thatcher and Reagan, uh, it was a cultural, a cultural um, program that instituted a new common sense. Um, that where they couldn't, they couldn't enact their policies. They they knew they wouldn't be able to enact their policies successfully if the common sense still surrounded the idea of social democratic solidarity. So they had to um, discursively embed uh, throughout their societies, their respective societies, that, um, that, that welfare was, was a pathway to ruin and that anyone who partook in welfare were a scrounger or were, were, were something that uh, you couldn't be proud of. Um, I just just created stigma, right. so I think, say, give fifteen twenty years later, where hegemonic hegemonic status is achieved and capitalist realism comes into its own, is where those discursive pathways are fully disturbed, like like um, like just sweeping sweeping the sand, sweeping your tracks from the sand as you go, sort of thing. I get um, it. I get you. I, the, this what I'm talking about is what Stephen was talking about in the first chat. The uh, s- new social media, um, the total atomization of society and communication, and um, the, the 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 too many alternatives and the utter lack of ability to uh, to come together um, collectively. So, and again, this is what Lane's talking about. Um, so. If uh, yeah, that, that's the culture. The culture we're we're consuming not only through cinema, uh, through music, but also through social media, and um, atomizing our our communicative tendrils, and um, and because of this, we're not focusing on the now. We're not we're not seeing what's happening. We're 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 focusing on something else. We're lamenting some loss. There's a lack. We know there's a lack, but we can't pit, put our finger on it because we're just not focusing on now. And is it in Mark Fisher where he's talking about the in the classroom with the earphones? Oh, and the earphones. The earphones. Uh, there's, there's not even any music playing. I think that was the reference, wasn't it? That it was the... Um, I think, yeah, it's the reference that the the individual has headphones on but nothing's or no is it something's playing and the headphones are on the table or they've just got headphones in and nothing's playing but it's I like it might be both the, i think it's the concept of being disconnected for one second is like absolutely unnerving yeah you just want to know it's um you want to know it's there you don't need to actually be using it yeah 100 but you gotta know that it's like the music's playing in the background rather than uh even is like it, the I- idea that the headphones are just sitting on the desk says this term fuck what's the term it's like it's not libidinal it's something between libidinal and tactile i think but it's, there's something that we we just need fuck i can't remember the term but yeah sorry 
No, I think I'm doing a terrible job at actually trying to bring up that that, that reference. <laughs> no, no, that, was, well, that, was, that sounded like it. But yeah, yeah I okay. just wanted to enhance it with that. Um, it, uh, <laughs> we're doing a terrible job. Um, moving along, though, the mm. the this is what the whole point with art is. Um, with that that move is bringing up with art, um, because this is this is our this is our this is literally our way of reflecting what's happening in the world and communicating it to others mm-hmm. and to institute a new common sense. Um, one, one contra um, in uh, possessive individualism and the idea that we're all just standalone people and what we're born with is, is the only resource at our fingertips. Okay. And does the critique element of that also, I mean, I guess it's all still part and parcel of it, but I guess you, and maybe, maybe this is more going back to, to Fisher's idea, because there's definitely obviously that idea of a kind of, um, uh, there's an actual word of this, there's an actual word and actually it comes up, maybe it's better to bring this up later on, because um, it comes up, it's a term from Gramsci um, regarding, I think, well, the Mark Fisher, sorry, the uh, Mark Fisher example is of the film Wally in capitalist realism, where it kind of, uh, dis- you know, it sort of, sort of unravels and well, it kind of rolls out in front f- in front of the viewer. The the sort of Earth was essentially just overdeveloped, you know, used up. It's a dried husk, and and the Wally character is left as a sort of janitor, just kind of like packing up everything hmm. um humans have gone off world they've become you know completely in a in 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 able to look after themselves even walk just because it's just not a thing you even do anymore there's an over sort of a, an overlording corporation which i think fisher points out really aptly is like it's always an over a lurching corporation yeah, yeah. is the enemy in these things and and we can live our anti-capitalism through this. Like this is something we can also, especially, and this is something, it's a phenomena that quite fascinates me is like with regards to things like Instagram or Twitter or social media in general, where you have to very quickly give someone a snapshot of your experience, which probably gets very Lacanian uh, in another set, in another conversation to have. But this idea that I have 20 like, characters or just one photo to display everything about me and my situation right now in this second Mm -hmm. and you have to like it like that's the outcome of this so um we can live like and identify and basically express ourselves by saying i like wally and i love what pixar did with this idea of look what happened to humanity and because i like this therefore i am you know, I have these thoughts, which are, say, anti-capitalist or, you know, um, you know, anti-authoritarian or whatever. Um, but then we don't have to move past that. We don't really have to actually do anything past that, I guess. In it's all, I don't know, in a way, it kind of feels like the same limitations as, say, representative democracy as it stands. It's like, well, the guy I voted for, he's the guy who, are, you know, sort of is on my side. And he's, 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 well, they've done the best. Thing. Outlet, they've done yeah. the best. They've done the best they could because they went in there and gave it their all. But yeah. there's no extra ask of them. And I guess, again, this stuff starts to probably get into uh, left populism. But this idea of there's no extra ask. There's no, um, I guess, deepening of what that representation entails. The same with there is no anti-capitalist action that occurs after the sentiment or the experience in the cinema of watching Wally. It's just a, well, I'm anti-capitalist because I liked Wally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I don't know if that comes into the, but sorry, I, I just to round that off to my point was, I don't know if that comes it back into the art and critique areas that it's not only art can maybe not only be a means to express what's going on around us and then obviously share that or to, to express those feelings to the world and, you know, hopefully, I guess, well, in a positive note, hopefully incite something Mm -hmm. uh, amongst other people to get a conversation occurring or a discourse to begin, but also to be able to identify where art is being used in a sense to maintain that status quo, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Does that that come into it as well? Um, Not explicitly, but like that's 
that would be that would be that's that would be absolutely the point if you i mean yeah probably jesus you should fucking go do something like that because i don't think i don't think um that's that's a thing yet but excuse me yeah so i mean in the first instance uh it's art to communicate the the the, the sort of the 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 experiences of education and subordination um but also art art to juxtapose shit art i guess <laughs> um it would be very good actually mm. i wonder that guy who um broke the egg or the glass or some shit in a new york museum like the journalist or an artist broke another artist's piece i went oh sorry so maybe maybe oh, that like, was maybe that was his performative art to show that this was shit perhaps is that the is that the same guy who ate the banana oh the guy who ate the banana yeah oh, was the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the egg, banana. <laughs> when when you've got a one year old, eggs and bananas are the exact same. I um, know, I, everything's got tracers and it all blurs into one. I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I suppose um, I suppose that's what culture jamming is as well. Um, when you're when you're actually targeting the advertisement and the art of it, uh, subverting the the symbolic uh, representation in subtle ways. Um, yeah sure. that is that is that so i know absolutely that's but it but i don't yeah it's not often spoke about i guess um the and I, the reason i said like a art and critique movement i guess in a banal way is just to include people writing about it because not everyone's sure. great at sure. artistically representing things or expressing themselves uh but also i suppose you it you can expand that to yeah to, to fuse them together and uh, create create a, anything you want really um but it, it is just uh, the need to and I, I did i did feel that um steven sort of underplayed this a lot um in the first chat but like the need to um to communicate these things with each other and you know if a critical mass is achieved like you would i i use the term critical mass and you use the term um top loading um i assume to achieve oh. critical mass um that i think that's that will have powerful uh outcomes um particularly in terms of developing a left populism hmm. um which we show. Yes. Uh, that was that was great. No, I love it. I love it. That was great. Um so she kicks that off. Um and I wonder can we do this in twenty five minutes? No, thirty minutes and that'll make it two hours. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we need to we need to work on this. Um yeah, I think we've got some we've we've some Nice little shortcuts that we can take from this, though. That's true. That's true. Uh, it's worth it. Hmm. Um, I, it's it's sort of it's fast flowing, but there's a lot of it. But the, the, I, I did break it down into points each section, uh, each chapter. Uh-huh. Uh, so I think I will just stick to them, and we'll see how we go. Absolutely. Um, so interject if you want to hit on a point, and cool. I'll do the Absolutely. same if anything occurs. But basically. So having treated, um, having kicked kicked off the hegemonic strategy as a critique of the traditional left, um, going through the 90s with a defense of liberalism, um, by the time we get to, I suppose it's probably 2015, 2016, when this book is being written or conceived, neoliberalism is in crisis. Um, I mean, ten years beforehand, neoliberalism came to be in crisis with the with the crash. Um, not only not only were um, did neoliberalism, as we previously described, circumvent political avenues for people to legitimately express their dissent. There was no alternative for people to vote for. Um, there was no consensus, or there was no consensus. There was only consensus. Consensus mm. or madness. Mm. Um. Uh, um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the crash, not like the politics, 
of the day took that away from them but the crash then took the money element from society that that which placated the um the possibility of antagonism um of course if you if you have enough cash there's very little to give out about and when you've got none there's everything to give out about legitimately so mm. and this is the crisis of neoliberalism um and which has led to populist movements and because the left left the left the populist field uh was and not only in the last 10 years but like beginning in the 90s um the populist movement has been slowly bubbling away mentioned by move back in the 90s slowly bubbling away um to rupture in the likes of donald trump and the success of nigel farage and um you've got examples of it across europe as well uh the far right um are agitating um the discontent and forming populist movements um to, to, so um i mean it's an opportunity i think i think when when trump was elected um i i so, i sort of like tried to calm some calm some upset by saying oh, as bad as trump is he's opened the door here uh, he's shown people that an alternative is possible. We just need to uh, close the door as such, not not indefinitely. Um, we need to close the door with with a left alternative. You know, let's right. let's okay, not not close the door. Let's step in. Let's step through the yeah, threshold that that, that that Trump has invited by opening yeah. this door. Um, and and we need to get our ass in gear. And um, and this is, I suppose, and I think this is what. I felt Stephen was missing in the in the last chat. Like so, like he brought up the point of the um, the markets. Um, since market capitalism, this is that we're in a paradigm that needs a, a, a radical rupture. But there's the imminence of our current situation, and if you're not a um, accelerationist, uh, you, you, we need to sort of. Um, this is the this is the the thing that needs to happen is to 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 mount that alternative um and and fill that space that's opened you know what i'm saying yeah no i think yeah it was a there was the the preoccupation wasn't there of like market market logic and also like militaristic forces it's like how how does how does one go up against this i think was was quite a heavy sort of like that was where it kind of seem to brick wall each time was like mm. you know I mean, we he, need we need to mount a i guess yeah what what seemed like a much more well i'm not really sure because i don't think he actually articulated it as revolutionary but like this idea yeah, very, that, very good point he didn't like it didn't really it was like again a the it was a the space between the preoccupation of a very heavily fractured uh left and also an extremely uh, I suppose wealthy and militaristically uh, fortified. Right, um, what what are we doing there? Um, but it was never, yeah. The 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 mounting, I suppose, was never fully articulated. Ultimately, though, I do believe he was talking about the the the, the sort of the moment before all that, um, which I was talking about a minute ago. The uh, the wiping of the tracks from the sand, so mm-hmm. the 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 cultural disturbance. Um, the capitalist realism enacted uh, to or the discursive uh, disturbance, um, the discursive pathways, um, the inability that that we now have or then had. So I suppose in the last chat, that I mean, the, the one of the major points was, and with Lane's video, is that um, things are changing. Like politics is no longer a dirty word. People are getting engaged again. Uh, that that aspect, like so, I mean, like Stephen's preoccupation while like it insinuated that hard power to come and i think even muff talks about that yeah sure down the line there might be a revolutionary necessity because we might face like hard conflict um hmm. if if vested interests are have their backs up enough um but, but, but yeah but i think i think stephen was talking about like uh just how, how difficult a, a, a task even even getting this message out, getting this, getting the signifier across to enough people to to develop um, 
a, a populist front. Um, but regardless, the left need to bloody do it quick. And because the right have done it, um, A, it's even more important uh-huh. because, it, because once the right does, the far right does this, there is nothing but death and misery to come. Um, Precisely. They're, they're, left, they're left essentially articulating what was the 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 term excuse me um i have the sniffles um the term was i think is that the the descriptor is the overton window yeah it's like things are left uh, uh, you know as a as a right populism and masses um i suppose um support um they it leaves them uh able or more able to I suppose frame everything within the Overton window. So Absolutely. articulating things like working class politics and movements, um, any kind of even any kind of uh, resurgence of sense of collectivism, which traditionally, um, well, I don't know if I could say uh, traditionally necessarily because I'm sure there's obviously there's right wing collectivism as such, but in a sort of progressive sense, they can they can articulate collectivism in in and of the right, like of right-wing politics, but also articulated as progressive, which yeah. is also an extremely dangerous thing, a dangerous uh, place to leave them in. Uh, like the, the sort of the, the rhetoric of Jordan Peterson with regards to um, post-Marxist academics and all that sort of thing, the, mm. the, the culture, campus SJWs and all that, um, yeah. determining that as the left, void of any of the sort of um, actual content of of the left oh, um, yeah, beyond yeah, that absolutely. yeah so that's that's the, that's the sort of receding of the overton parameter huh. um by the effort by the efforts of the far right um huh. to exclude to, to to manipulate understandings people have of of what ought to be daily reference huh. um and and therefore changing um changing the effect of rhetoric mediated rhetoric uh so yeah, so they, they can easily just, when they say left, they're talking about a liberal center, but uh-huh. because they describe it as the left, they also inhibit the ability of the left, which has a lot of commonality in terms of rhetoric with the far right, in terms of like what you just touched on there, the collectivization and the anti-individualist uh-huh. elements of of the center and liberalism. Um. So the, the the natural appeal that the working class has for the left, they're coming to identify the left as this liberal centrism, and this is sort of what happened with um, with Corbyn, that uh, it, the, like the, the 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 North older working class um, identified Corbyn's whole project with this young London liberal elite, which is yeah. like that, you know. Yeah. The, the policy agenda and that element of labor and left-wing politics not totally divorced but are totally distinct um, yeah no, absolutely i think it's you see the same thing especially now uh well ongoing but i mean it has been ongoing since since whenever the i don't know since since the fall of communism the the american articulation of any kind of mount like i suppose I suppose any kind of like even slightly hinting of any kind of passion uh, on the side of a left democratic party or, um, or sorry, left, you know, left uh, members of the democratic party, but like actual left. So for example, in the case of Bernie Sanders, there's this consistent mounted attack of always, always articulating him as a communist. Um, Like, but, but again, you also have to understand that it's a very loaded way that it's being used because yeah, it also it has a very particular definition um given the the current climate of who's been essentially you know call, saying what each of these words really means yeah um and how they're then being interpreted like again uh peterson just just one thing um I, something i keep recurrently hearing uh from peterson is um and actually i guess this is more of his his preoccupation with elements of the the with the status quo and or maybe the de-energizing of the left is like he loves critiquing the language used by 
um, what I guess the the post neo Marxists or post modern neo Marxists, whatever the fuck, um, the idea that uh, uh, this whole the language used by the left is is utterly preoccupied with the oppressed and the oppressor, and he's constantly calling for this idea of language being used in a much more you know we'll never ever find a consensus using language like this, mm. um, you know parties as we know them right now need to move away from this and it's the postmodern neo-marxists who are preoccupied with consistently division. articu yeah well do exactly division it's always an us and them um and he you know obviously you see this this as ironically postmodern like ironically postmodern um yeah absolutely in a way. that's the what that is the it's modern the, aspect of yeah. politics <laughs> I don't know, but again, we've we've already been through this. I think in prior chats, his his concept of grand narratives and postmodernity are interesting and likely skewed. Um, so sorry, yeah. There's this this the yes. Yeah, so sorry to go back on track. What we're saying, the concept of yeah. I'll I'll, I'll just continue. Uh, the um, the popular popular moments occur when a hegem hegemon a hegem half muck me. Um, popular moments occur, motherfucker. Populist moments occur when a hegemony becomes unstable through multiplication of unsatisfied demands. The left need to counter the right's populist initiative through federating social movements against post democracy. So she's arti- so the third way, as we were describing, is post uh, post democratic. It's the the liberal overdetermination of our society, mm-hmm. um, as we've already said. And articulating the we and the they is crucial, as you were just touching on. Um, and Jesus Christ, yeah, come on. I mean, I, like in, in that moment, that's sort of moves. Um, I, I don't think she said it so explicitly before. I mean, she probably has, but like to, to, to emphasize it so stripped down, just, just the we and the they is so crucial because that part of it is leading towards a universal mm-hmm. particular like constitutively particular universal but still a universal there's we can still have a we mm-hmm. um the people against the they the oligarchs yes um and um blah, 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 dem- democracy sort of being the empty signifier uh the thing that we which we wish to deepen and and you know i think so obviously, because I made the point with Stephen that um, that the far right have done this, especially with Make America Great Again, and while that is utterly an empty stig- signifier, I think the possibilities for replicating this model on the left um, are, it, it's a far more fruitful ground because it's less of an empty signifier. Like it, it's it's it like the idea of deepening democracy or radical democracy is. Um, is is empty enough to to sort of constitute a solution uh, for so many grievances like oh. um because we've been so excuse me because we've been so like society's been so void of democracy not only in neoliberalism but in all of liberal democracy and before because um not only is the is our economics and productive uh, capacities not not democratized but our gender relations and our race relations um um relations sexuality uh relations um of any sort of any relationship of subordination on any level in any given moment in time and space um all can benefit from a democratization uh which is merely not merely the the um the introduction of the capacity to negotiate that relationship Mm -hmm. so as an empty signifier it still retains quite an amount of substance for any subject position which which aims to punch up at power Mm -hmm. which which seeks to attain more power in relation to those with power over them. And I think, I mean, I think ultimately rather than left and right, 
um, in terms of populist movements, left and right, is, while we need a left populist movement, discursively, rhetorically, strategically, the left and right thing is, I'll agree with a lot of other people from various perspectives, is, is, a, little bit, um, is a little bit redundant. But the idea of um, punching upwards or punching downwards is very effective. So if, uh-huh. if we're in a situation where, where people have been, if we see the consensus third way as not, not simply the negation of politics, but the negation of the will to express social division, uh-huh. then the success of any post that moment, Trump or Farage, um, in 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 our in reality at the moment, this, their success is based on the providence of that avenue. Follow me, and I will allow you to express social difference. Um, and it just so happens it'll suit their um, agenda for people or t- for them to suggest that okay. So here's the opportunity to point uh, opportunity to express social difference, but do it punching downwards because hey, <laughs> if you punch upwards, oh. you might hit me in the face. Um, and that is that is what the left is. And the the difference between Corbyn and Sanders' projects uh, ultimately, I think, was that um, Corbyn was was the left and he didn't target a they as clearly mm-hmm. as Sanders. Sanders is punch up, punch up, punch up. And Corbyn is, look at my wonderful return of the left moment. And people are identifying with Sanders far more than they appear to identify with uh, Corbyn. In terms of popular, I mean, there's lots of people identified with Corbyn, just uh-huh. in terms of a popular movement across the UK. You can't say that uh, it was a success. No, no, I agree. I, I, and I mean, I think that could be, that's a whole other chat in and of itself, I suppose. Or actually, I mean, well, we can have it, but there's also a lot of very good sources of it being had. But yeah, I don't know. I, there was a feeling of things getting lost in the moment of the, rather than the movement. I don't know if that's fair to say. Um, whereas I feel with, with Sanders, it is about the, the pushing forward. The movement whereas with yeah with corbyn i think a lot of a lot of people i know got caught up in the movement and i think that that's where you saw that fractured or that fracturing then of people who lost interest in corbyn post the loss because mm-hmm. it means that things didn't work whereas well we hence the struggle <laughs> yeah and, and i was just gonna say the um you know it's not all lost just because like i i wasn't i wasn't um I wasn't pinning the success there in terms of the election. Like when uh-huh. I said it wasn't successful, I didn't mean just no, because of, of the election, but in terms of the deflation. But I mean, I mean like it looks like Rebecca Long barely won't be, and I would identify her as the, the sort of the legacy leader for that project. Uh, it looks like she is lagging well behind, not a, not a Neo Blairite, but, um, Someone with uh, a lot less ambition, and and you know people go, oh, it's electable, and that's the ambition. But like, you know, what's a what's a labor government without labor policies? Yeah, that's that's a very um, that's that's a very noisy statement. I just feel like that's that 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 idea. Oh, you know, he's electable. It's just noise. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that too. Yeah, I mean, that's what's happening yeah, with. Well, that feeling, was happening. Filling dead air yeah. was happening with uh, Sanders about two weeks ago or a week ago until it looked like it wasn't justifiable any longer, and he looks mm. like a serious contender. Mm. Conservative elements declared in the seventies society was becoming ungovernable due to democratic surge. What do you think about that, folks? I like. You know, I can't get over this. This idea that, like, the Trilateral Commission, Sam fucking Huntington, society is ungovernable because of a surge of dem- democracy with the uh, with the new social movements of the 60s and 70s. You just, you want too much. You want too you want much, too guys. Much. Just you want too much. Stop it. We're trying to just put everything in boxes. Naughty. Yeah. Stop. Like, we give you an inch and you take a mile. And we got to tamp you down. <laughs> exactly. 
You gotta cut off your toes. That's what hurts <laughs> when you run. Yeah. And the the traditional left, Move argues, in that situation failed to capitalize on incorporating these new social movements because it was still obsessed with them. Um, class politics and allowed for as we've already mentioned the uh, the cultural programs of thatcher and reagan to institute a new common sense and a new mm-hmm. politics and institute their their heinous ideology um and attain a hegemonic status um a cultural and ideological victory uh because yeah the left left the left well actually in that's in that's in that in this pre-moment at the very tail end of social democracy, it's not the left, left, the left. It was the left failed to adapt um, to the changing field uh, from in respect to to Mouffe's postmodern um, outlook. Sure. This hegemonic project uh, attacked social democracies, common sense, as I mentioned. It instituted as hegemon. Um, it was instituted as hegemonic uh, with New Labour in ninety seven, failing to challenge neoliberalism um and the left allowed social democracy to become social liberalism in this this that social liberalism is the the moment where the left left the left um Mm. which is now in crisis um popular movement on multiple fronts needs doesn't need a radical break um thatcher didn't need a radical break so this is an interesting point that she makes um Thatcher didn't need a radical break, so we don't need a radical break. We can use the political. We can ride the wave of the return of the political. We can mount a counter or a multi-hegemonic strategy because we're countering an old hegemony and we're ensuring another one doesn't institute itself. Um, We can do all this. And hypothetically, we can sort of say something like Corbyn again and Sanders here, um, you know, get there and, you know, start democratizing to, to a, to a sort of a small degree. The, um, well, probably the, the economy actually that did seem to be the focus, but, but no doubt that the sort of, um, the, the democratizing of new social movements that's already underway uh, will continue and maybe even accelerate. There's, there'll be a hell of a lot more space uh, for people to to um, legitimize their particularities uh, than in the last couple of years under Trump and um, the xenophobic aspects and rhetorics of Brexit, um, at the very least. Uh, so there you have a sort of a platform for pushing the Overton window back and determining um, a new center, uh, a new common sense and a new horizon uh, Mm. to, to achieve and a new sort of uh, wake to recede from. Um, That's the sort of the ideal, I guess. Um, And this doesn't need a radical break is her point because when Thatcher instituted neoliberalism, there was no revolution. It was revolutionary but there was no rupture. So is that possible? Is it enough for the left to, to model Thatcher's revolution, um, to institute hegemony initially with the first left instance of not neoliberalism and as a counter moment to the imminence of the far right? It's certainly enough to fucking to ensure the far right uh, doesn't get back into office. That's obviously fantastic. But is it enough to? Um, is it a point where we can work for more radical change, mm. or, or will it lead to a stabilization of the status quo and the rich will somehow manage to avoid? any any major upset any major redistributive um programs i don't know Mm. because i think zizek would would say like are we wasting our time with a hegemonic project should we just be focusing on um 
spearheading uh, toward a radical break uh, through revolution because there's a chance that hegemonic project necessitates a, a lack of radicalism um, sure we 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 find a consensus i suppose with the center as so as to keep the fascists out but then fail to push past i guess the the highly deeply sorry deeply entrenched uh center consensus um that i guess people we we comfortably exist within i suppose so yeah failing i guess yeah the idea that failing the the efforts of both the left and the center it 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 i guess uh relinquishes the opportunity perhaps um if we're merely focused on just making sure the uh, the fascists aren't there and then we can carry on well yeah i mean i guess i guess that is a, that's almost a separate question i think like uh, it should at the moment the or maybe it's not separate because or maybe it is the imminence of the far right is again something that yeah that's basically what you just said something that the the left and the center when we say center here we we do mean the right don't we it's it's the conservative element of society sure sure um, absolutely yeah no i don't wouldn't be referring to the like center center left so to speak would be the, I mean, I mean, they're pretty conservative well, the, well the yeah to, that's the whole, two as well I suppose. yeah the, the whole point sorry what i'm saying there is like the center I, I think swap. i think what i think what people should like to simplify this i think people should when they're saying the center should consider that the right just not the far right mm. it, it is it is it is essentially conservative rather it's yeah. left center or right center um mm-hmm. under neoliberalism so i mean obviously because there's the argument that le- neoliberalism is economic and it's not n- left or right but actually it's implemented by like its effect is conservation of the status quo mm. despite yeah. despite its um its radical information I- I- implementation and its radical effects on society like it was revolutionary it accelerated the um the return of um previous conservative social hierarchical organizations and um effectively subdued the progressive democratic which we were just talking about um uh trends in in the last century so i mean it's the fucking it's the right wing like it's just not the far right hmm. um i think i think we should we should feel legitimate we should be able to say that legitimately now hmm. um so leaving that question hanging there um the other the other question so uh, reg- disregarding the imminence of of the far right um will the hegemonic project be enough is is overturning neoliberalism enough is oh is is like doing thatcher but on the left enough i don't know depends on depends on whether you want a far left society or not i guess how far left do you want it mm. what the hell i mean like how and again far... i think go on sorry no go ahead go ahead no no you go for it I was just going to say, I mean, does that actually mean, would that eventually um, become the negation of difference that Muff was actually talking about and saying a chain of, the chain of equivalence doesn't negate difference if you were to, I suppose, push for a far left society, does that, could that, could that eventually lead to a negation of the difference. I don't believe perhaps. so. No? No, I don't, no, I don't think so. I like, mean, maybe that's a very extreme kind of uh, kind of idea that I'm posing there. I think um, it, I think we touched No, you know what? no, no, because well, unless unless you're saying yes. I mean, like yeah, there's plenty of opportunity for that to be the case and that's exactly what mm. like she's arguing against. Mm. But I don't think necessarily. I think um and I don't I can't remember did this come up in the last chat but um sort of my issue with her is the is the idea that we can escape the form of individualism that we that has developed organically over the to this point in the last two three hundred years or whatever um can we just can we we articulate a, a definition of and this is a different well kind of a, a different shade on that question um you know, if if we want to maintain uh, elements of 
liberalism of of individual freedoms um which i think i, I think yes is is the sort of general answer it's going to be can we reconceive of the individual uh, in a way distinct to what we have today so in in terms of the different stages in terms of um the modern individual in terms of the the um the the sort of the fade in of the sort of far more possessive individualist the re- the return of the um the sort of liberal elite of pre-war era the the thatcher individual um the brutal um anarchic <laughs> uh, situation we we're now finding ourselves in the dissolution of communities um the inability of them for them to to look after themselves uh, to, to support themselves and the competitive economic conditions that are being foisted upon people in order for them to ever hope to to sort of support themselves whether as on an individual level or a community level um to the sort of the the positive the more healthy and more able side of that uh the the, the liberal elite itself the sort of young happy people who you know ha- sort of have enough money and partake in enough sort of decadence to feel that life isn't too serious and there isn't sort of all that meaning in the world and you know the narcissism um mm. that sort of breeds from that uh the irony and dispassion of the sort of the, the hipster and millennial um generation the hyper liberalism uh the the the, the 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 total focus on identity so like you know there's three stages of the individual if you're seeing that in a historic context and determining that it's a, a, an organic enough development of course there's been interventions but were those interventions organic also doesn't matter it's not a, not to make a teleological argument but um just for the sake of because it's a historic instance, um, that's an organic development of the individual. Can we redefine the the coordinates of freedom and equality through a hegemonic articulation of the left that will overcome or transcend um, this 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 form, this vision of what the individual is and can be and ought to be, uh, and 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 the branches from that philosophy, um, the the where that might lead in the future. Like, okay, so in this book, Moof is even saying, and I've said this before, I'm sure, uh, that we've neglected um, the class class politics. You know, we've 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 tended to the liberal defending the liberal aspect of our society for too long and okay so so the the overdetermination of liberalism in liberal democracy is one thing even if we got a democratic determination overdetermination in our society once more where would that leave people's sense of self and sense of the collective considering what it is today so like and i think i did bring this up before again as well i'm pretty sure like the Enlightenment project is an extrication of of the individual human body from the lump and subjugation of history, of of say like religious forces, um, monarchical forces, the aristocracy, the, the 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 brutal elites of the past. You know, I I, I conceive myself as an individual. I want that freedom. So that's the Enlightenment project, or a way of describing it in an essential sense um one essential sense out of many i'm sure um so and marx is part of that project i'm pretty sure he has a vision of the individual as well it's just an entirely different one to the one we have today or the one that seems ah, there is no one that we have today but the way it's enacted in a, in a macro sense how it's mm-hmm. manifesting and um and yeah and i just wonder can it is a is a revolutionary break necessary to sort of to regress to a point where we can readdress this and sort of um, 
begin instituting a, a different way of, of seeing the self or sensing the self. Mm. Or again, can we do a true hegemonic articulation within the system that we have at the moment? Um, I wonder. I wonder if, and I mean, this is maybe maybe a little backtracky, but I wonder if, um, and again, some of the topics that you know Muff goes into later on in the book, you know, especially regarding, and I guess this is something you know she's been working up to, you know, regarding this deepening of democracy. Um, I'm, you know, I overheard someone actually explain, you know, against the. Um, in contra to like the idea of um, a uh, a reassertion of what say um, um, well for example yeah um, representative democracy um, you know where is the democratic discourse with regards to how we or a people is represented um, in in that re- that relationship between representation and the people which in theory, is I suppose the the point of that that relationship, but there seems to me to be a sort of distinct lack then of democratic discourse between how that you know to what extent are those people and how are they or what, to what extent are those people represented? How are they represented? How is that informed or how is that representation informed? Um, and I remember overhearing someone on the back of a conversation of this discussing, yeah, but you know, people don't want to fucking vote for like every little fucking thing. <laughs> and, and like, and that actually worried me because I thought, yeah, you know what, this is actually a, a really fascinating and very, very important point this person's making. I was like, there are probably a lot of people who don't want that. And again, it's an outcome of a very entrenched set of I guess a reduction, a, a consistent erosion. What I feel of like is what I feel anyway from my reading of left populism is okay. the kind of democracy that you know Muff is is moving towards. How can they? How can they handle negotiating a supermarket? <laughs> uh, she I mean, she check, she says that too. I think um, he doesn't want to wake up every morning at five a.m. and go to the assembly hall and discuss how every bean is going to be sowed sure. through the day. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> That's Marinella, I mean, isn't it? I mean, there's a ton of things I'd probably love to have a bit more of an insight into how that works. Um, you know, and there are plenty of, I guess, you know, a, a, a surging of parties. That, well, I mean, specifically parties, I guess, within the context of Europe that do. Uh, and I mean, this is, again, another conversation we've had slightly offline about the, about more following down the, down the the topic of Brexit um, and progressive reasoning. Uh, what? Oh, sorry, the progressive reasons in which one could find to want to exit the European Union, um, or you know, could reasons for wanting to leave the European Union that could be conceptualized as progressive. Um, uh, this counter movement that's occurring um, that is an idea of saying we don't believe we can utterly reform uh you know the european union it's it's got too many blockers it's too well reinforced however let's attempt at a deepening of the democratic power that we as a united european people or or a federated europe have um and and this actually it's it's i need to go deeper into this but there is this standpoint there is this stance that people are starting to take is in a, a case of saying be skeptical um point fingers but at the same time would completely exiting put us in a better position than attempting a more in-depth look and a reinvigoration of and i think my original point back at the beginning of this was i think i see things like perhaps the outcome of brexit and the general election as a resurgence of people becoming reinterested in politics, which is, I think, what we were saying. Left or right, absolutely, yeah. Ab- exactly, exactly. So it is, you know, it's, it's around this, it's around, especially um, members of my family, we've had discussions regarding the kind of rise of Greta moving into, um, I'm sorry, I always forget their, their, um, their name, 
the um, environmentalist movement in the UK, uh, Extinction Rebellion. Sorry, that's terrible, but sorry, guys. Um, but moving from a, you know, having this kind of, I guess, extremely consensus informed uh, stance where we were told, you know what you got to do is fucking bamboo straws and you will atone for all the sins of all the environment, like the heinous environment, like, sorry, the, 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 the absolute terrifying extent of like environmental disasters that have been occurring. And a lot of people obviously bought into this. They, you know, we all have cloth tote bags and bamboo straws and whatever um, t-shirts that say there is no planet B, but actually what's occurring now is I think people are seeing that there was only an extent of that. What moving past that is becoming the, um, the, I guess, dissatisfaction with being equated uh, your personal uh, like effect on the planet, your personal carbon footprint has been equated with that of say BP oil um, or large corporations paying to pollute the air in other countries. And I think that that is also, again, like Brexit has got people interested in politics again, because maybe some people even just yeah. to an extent felt they don't know what they were sold and suddenly they want to be interested in this again. This uh, dissatisfaction with the idea of my my idea of how I was saving the planet actually kind of sucks because I'm having a corporation point a finger at me and say I'm just as bad as they are. <laughs> so um, I'm seeing this even with people in in my personal s spheres where they're actually starting to become far more convinced that to buy a bamboo straw is essentially could, can be equated with ignoring the systematic, the economic. Um, the industrial, Country, the country-sized lump of plastic in the Atlantic Ocean. Precisely, yeah. The 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 industrial reasoning behind some of this, the the economic, the system, the systemic, I suppose, or system, yeah, the systemic reasons for this. It's not because you just got a flight over at Christmas to go see your family. <laughs> so I, think, I guess that's the the limits of neoliberal individualism. Like if mm. if it was always a displacement towards individual responsibility in the uh in the um the <laughs> competitive market context um that i mean that's that's the answer to everything it's like you're just not competing in the correct way you're just not consuming in the correct way you're just not you know that you've got the free choice now and and just that the philosophical roots being possessive individualism it just doesn't fit it's just ridiculous mm. um i think we should try to see what see what else we can conjure up here going through these notes because mm. uh, it'd be a shame not to get to the end of the the book mm. um, oh shit no left hegemonic project a struggle to define for society uh, like we've been touching on there uh, liberty and equality and uh, that was literally the question i was asking um will that be enough um for move it is democracy as a principle um enough to counter neoliberalism um but is it yeah this is steven's point but is it enough to counter capitalism um discursive exterior required for sites of subjugation to become subjects so that's just uh you're never necessarily aware that uh, uh, that you are being subordinated as such until you have an external discourse to appeal to, such as the democratic uh, invention, um, to articulate that relation of subjugation. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of importance of those discursive interventions. Um, popular movement hegemonic projects struggle to disart out oh, the, the the struggle of a populist movement hegemonic project is to disarticulate the sedimented practices of the established hegemony. So this is um, this is the Google, <laughs> the, the left Google uh, thing. Yeah. Um, the, the project would be to di yeah disarticulate the the sedimented practices, being the the enactment of power um, to conceal and also to enact in themselves those relationships of subordination and subjugation. Um, uh, to disarticulate them in terms of to like as exactly what you were just talking about the, the sort of the logics that uh, are put in place that you know um that sort of impede 
a bureaucrat's ability to act as a human in a moment. Um, well, we can't because this is the way we do things. So that's the power of logic, like like a banker or a civil servant. To just there, there, there's a sort of the rules to the game. There's a fairness, a code, um, the logic, the market logic. Oh well, we can't write off that debt because the economy will blah 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 blah. Um, uh, and that and that that stops us from conceiving in that moment the human situation, the human necessity, where we appeal because it's a systemic situation because it's a a system of rules we appeal to that we can't we can't just change the rules in the moment to help you to eat some bread and put some clothes on before you die of starvation or the pneumonia first who knows you know this ridiculous um bind we've that the logics we put ourselves in um so to disarticulate these these logics and to rearticulate new logics, uh, and I think that's that's overridingly the um, regardless of a, an argument of plurality or universality of of economism or new social movements of identity politics, class politics, the overriding sort of mission of the left is to articulate this sort of a, this human <laughs> human logic like uh, we need to eat. We need to be warm. We need to be safe, and we need a fucking environment where we can breathe and drink clean water and stuff. Mm. Um, it's the basis right there. I would have thought. Um, and but to do so, uh, the point would be, or the mission would be to establish nodal points uh, of a new hegemonic, hegemonic social uh, formation. Um, so. I think these nodal points in the war position um, through these articulations and this discursive game of uh, networking um, globally, um, we've got to get outposts, I think. Um, identify like centers of, 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 our, of where the logic is being instituted. And, it, and again, it doesn't have to be universal. It's something that we can identify with in a loose sense. Uh, oh yeah, no, I like that. Might not necessarily work here, but at least it's against this other logic that I definitely don't like. It's mm. not neoliberal. It's not the far right. Um, so I should, you know, I should put up my flag so that they can see my flag and we can identify with each other and, you know, start reconciling these nodal points. And mm. uh, again, in a war position, and we're, we're we're taking back ground, so to speak. And it doesn't have to be sort of topographical. It can be topological, like, you know, it doesn't have to be on a map. You can scrunch up the map and um, geography becomes an entirely different thing. Mm. Um, that sort of thing. Um, Move says it's a false dilemma between reform and revolution. But we won't go into that unless... No, uh, no I think we, we briefly covered it earlier on anyway. We sort of went into her, her articulations of like the various levels or, or various i guess how she conceives of like the various states of reform all the way through to i guess the revolution oh yes break. yes yeah that's exactly this point that's the point in the book that she brings that up um i think it's i think she's just art, she's articulating there like the idea of like a very the i guess what actually well what actually might be what maybe one could context as what we were saying earlier on this idea of like the uh, <clears throat> the left's attempts with the center as in only stopping say far right getting in, but actually does that push without that initial push? I guess it just does it just reinforce the status quo if the left doesn't actually make a movement past you know these attempts as well as then saying well, okay now we're going to look at you the center or the, the conservative center and say, right now we're going to tackle this. Um, if the, so I guess there's like, yeah, there's like a, a, like a sort of soft reform there that says, well, you know, we just don't want that because that looks fucking terrifying, but we we're kind of comfortable enough here. And then she takes that through, I think this, you know, through the, the other pull at that is a utter revolutionary break yeah. from democ, you know, the, the established, I guess systems that we have in place now, and then she sort of posits 
radical democracy somewhere in the center of these, as in it it needs that radical, you know, revolutionary momentum, but not so revolutionary as to overthrow. Yeah, exactly, as to break through um, the established systems. You know that that I think that's the extent of how she describes it. The um, this is another interesting one. Um, state the state is a crystallization of relations and forces a terrain of struggle and so this is like her argument that we shouldn't just have an exodus that the state should be seen as as a frontier in our, in our struggle um mm-hmm. it consists of uneven branches integrated uh by hegemonic practices so like all branches of state uh whether expanded or reduced um is a hegemonic articulation and again is contingent um and it shouldn't be our goal to see state or to hope that it withers away uh but we need to become state and i think that's a gramscian um idea yeah i think you're right um and and again it's 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 still in line with this anti or not anti but like the idea that because she pushes quite heavily against the essential well since since hss now this idea of essentialist we sh- you know the idea of like recon- fully reconciled essentialist communism should be put down or yeah, at least it, as an impossibility side. exactly and i think that that sort of toes in line with that still it's like let's not count on the state to wither away nor should we be letting it wither away it's like it's considered it has, a, it has a regulative um function hmm. and the point is to become state and i think i mentioned this before um to 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 live state um to live as the state um and i think it's like to sort of um to become state to democratize the instead of bureaucratize the the functions of state to allow um local people access the organization of local public services and to mm-hmm. to to i mean obviously initial stages of this is what Corbyn and Sanders uh, proposed to to sort of um, bring up bring back on board services that were essential to the public um, but then the next phase would then be to imbue communities with um, with responsibility over these things uh, over these services um, and that's to be state to live like to to have to have a community run like in terms of state and, and I mean this is this is a, sli- a sliding scale sort of effort here and I think you can bring it all the way down to what you were saying the person was saying with the the voting on every single little thing and Zizek giving out I don't want to get up in the morning and discuss every single thing we're going to do for the day um, and like Marin Aleda in um, near Seville is um, sort of this brilliant to my mind brilliant example of 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 being state of living state um where governance is the center of governance the mayor who instituted this uh communist project in the town um you know brings brings him as the location of power into the community and then hands it out <laughs> do you know what i mean like okay here's the responsibility here's responsibility here's responsibility let's all make decisions and let's do this and let, let us let us be let let the organs of state be the thing we do during the day let let that be the production you know uh, the, mm. the, the here's the means of production we've taken it from the capitalists uh the state has us now now i'm drawing it down to the ground and now we're all going to operate it democratically mm. Mm. Marxist mistake claiming that liberal democracy was a superstructure of capitalism. This is a, a contingent articulation uh, because economic liberalism is not political liberalism. And um, it's a mistake to sort of conflate all the different combinations of basically enlightenment politics and economics in one sort of way. I, I guess move tends to make the argument in like to paraphrase like the a lot of sort of leftists might be like sort of like a, a teenager kicking kicking off against a parent you know it's just it's it it's there's, there's a homogenous target liberal mm-hmm. democracy or liberalism you know and uh, it's the catch-all for 
all badness. And obviously, mm. her whole point is no, there's really important aspects of liberalism, and we need to, we can work within it. Blah blah blah. We've covered that. Um, so deepening a democracy is anti-capitalist um, um, because so many relations of subjugation are due to capitalist relations of production. So I mean, I think that's that's an important thing for move to say, considering having began her career so vehemently um, against economism. Of course, that doesn't equate with economism. It's just a common sense um, entailment of the various ways. Um, we, we, we'll pick that argument, various ways of that, that power enacted stuff. We'll pick that argument up again uh, with more, more detail on sort of Zizek's take on that, um, how maybe there is a sort of an underlying primacy to class um, that structures other um, other relationships, um, but not now. Okay, need to articulate struggle in a moment of, oh yeah, this is the Google thing. We need to articulate struggle in a moment of antagonism to, um, to identify the material causality and the barriers to its rectification. Uh, connecting people with what impedes their situation or their will and um this and this is the art side of things art and critique movement because um because when you when you when you're when you're identifying those issues um the emotion and the passion is there in that moment as well it's not lost in translation um so that's yeah that's the that's the google the google thing <laughs> that we talked about before um, oh, and this is where she talks about uh, where democracy can act as the hegemonic signifier around which uh, struggles can identify with uh, and a re-instituting of party and political representation to repoliticize society. Um, so yes, working class demands are neglected. Accumulation through wage labor, though, uh, is now accumulation through dispossession. That's a that's a David Harvey point. Um, oh, I remember the quote. Yeah, well, it's, well, it's a passage from from this book, right? Yeah, um, I can't remember which, but I think it's a history of a brief history of neo neoliberalism. Yeah. So it's the in social democracy, capitalism enfranchised economically uh, the work uh, a large section of the working class. Um, but it was still capitalism and it wasn't radical socialism. And since then um, it was dispossession through wage labor because, because it through the, through the classical Marxism and the, um, the creation of surplus value, um, you were always undermining the enfranchisement you were offering through those capitalist processes. However, since, with with neoliberalism something far more brutal is happening and um in the, the rise in inequality is not only the rich getting richer but it is the poor getting poorer and not in a relative sense to the rich but in a relative sense to their parents our parents and um and theirs more importantly and um it's it's to dispossession um something like six million people were became homeless in the crash in america something Jesus. outrageous like there's, a, there's there's an amazing graph and it's in the shape of an elephant <laughs> and it's basically the, the the hollowing out of the middle class whatever um <laughs> uh, since the crash um where was i a people in very commas needs constructing around um needs constructing around the need to uh, deepen democracy uh, with collective will, considering a wide variety of forms of subordination, exploitation, domination, and discrimination, as well as environmental issues. Um, we can avoid eroding plurality through such a, uh, an act of universalization uh, through anti essentialist approach, where the people is not an empirical referent, as it was in classical Marxist, the, uh, mm -hmm. the proletariat. 
um, the empirical reference. There it is. This is what we want, and this is the thing that scientifically blah blah blah. Um, not as an empirical referent, but as a discursive political construction. So I think that's the distinction that you were making earlier. Um, you know, it's not it's not an end; it's a means. Mm. It's uh, it's not it's not the end case. This is not the vision that we're going to go to. It, we're not going to attempt to achieve a social totality through this vision, um, a universal vision. Uh, we will enact a political struggle through discursive construction of mm. yeah this uh, this universal idea yeah i think she I, maybe i'm misremembering how these 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 points maybe align but i think at some point maybe it's in that same space she she uh, I th- i'm paraphrasing but the idea that these um i guess you know this this universal or like or populist movement will it won't necessarily be informed by history as as in the traditional marxist marxist sense like as in there's an end goal it'll be yeah. informed by i th- i i know i don't know the exact i can't remember the exact words she used but i guess like current climate Absolutely. um current affairs what's happening and i guess that that maybe is that kind of does that align with like the kind of temporality or the lava lamp kind of like movement between pieces, but there's, there can always be uh, something that kind of shoots through the center, which allows then for it to be articulated in another sense, perhaps, yeah. small, you know, creating those change, but it's, it's a, almost like it can, it can be a temporality, but not necessarily that doesn't in, in that doesn't sort of allude to flimsiness of it. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Well, her, like her big worry is just the um, is the crystallization, um, which will stifle our, our freedom in mm. in a system, and it's not so much from a liberal a liberal fear. Like it's not like oh, I'm I'm free enough, I'm I'm a happy enough individual with with enough access to material resources that I don't want to lose power, which often mm. that's what the fear of democracy and socialism is, or I should have said that the other way around, socialism a given and democracy because whether they like it or not they've fucking dumped it in the trash um it, it, her fear is the the brutality that that entails what you're talking about for the, for it to turn off the lava lamp to turn off the heat in the lava so that it cools and crystallizes um what what a shame because first of all the image that it solidifies in is just one captured naive, but setting aside the naivety, one captured image in time. So like the beautiful fru- fruition of, of, of human history is, is brought to a standstill. Um, just keep it open and, and let, let, let us see what we do with it. Just open it up more. Yeah, just let everyone do it. <laughs> Don't, don't turn, turn the off the don't turn off the wave machine. Oh, yeah, don't turn off the wave machine. The wave machine. <laughs> it's so weird when it was turned off. You're like, oh, what's everything missing? just everything just yeah. Well, exactly as you said, it's that strange feeling of Black. what's missing. I don't know what's happening. I'm still in the water, but I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just doesn't feel like water anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yeah. It's a different kind of water. Uh, <laughs> um, equivalence achieved through multiplicity of unmet demands, integrated demands, uh, multiplicity of various demands, <laughs> um, splitting the demand between um, ontic content and new ontological identities, I think I'm saying there. So I think we'll get to this in the next chat. In fact, because considering the time, I'll, I will just leave that one there, Antic and on, Ontological. Uh, and we'll yeah pick that up next in two weeks. Um, not a, it's, uh, so, so the chain of equivalence, the popular movement, uh, the populist movement is not a mere coalition, but um, constructed through uh, like uh, a struggle. Um, a dialectical struggle. Um, 
and it's susceptible to rearticulation through counter hegemonic interventions. So, I mean, this this happens both ways. If we're talking about the Overton window, assuming there was some sort of, and I suppose there was to a degree, um, with with momentum and whatever the, the is there a name for the grassroots movement uh, for Sanders, um, um, sections of those can be sort of. Um, taken away by say the far right just like the overton window that we're talking about so if, if some sort of hegemonic um gains in the war position was made by the far right which it was uh, particularly through the idw um flying circus um you know that was a real sort of mouthpiece for for consolidating those nodal gains uh, once they were established um and by pushing the Overton parameters to redefine those situations, um, there was a rearticulation by their hegemonic project that um, overdetermined the identity of sections of what would have been part of a left populist movement to fall in with the the, the right, the far right populist movement. Um, and of course, the same is open to us. And I think that's. Um, that's when I sort of said the the, the tongue in cheek thing to Stephen. Um, the far right have done all the hard work for us. We've just got to uh, defeat them. And it's like it sounds kind of difficult, but actually, we've just got to sort of parody what they're saying because most of the appeals they're making are democratic. And you know the the, the things that people are identifying with them is an inc- an increased democracy, which mm. in their case is an is a, a, a hollower, a more hollow empty signifier than the left can actually provide because the left's project is a deepening of democracy. Mm. Um, so, you know, we just got to say the same things, but mean it. And just reappropriate them. I guess actually yeah. the, the, the example of that is, um, and I think Muff says it in the book or it's, I don't know, I, I can't remember. I think it's in there though. The, um, the re- uh, signifying, I guess, of um, what was it? Uh, it said, no, I, I don't remember said this being the exact quotation, but the um, Corbyn's um, uh, for the many, not the few, mm-hmm. comes from Blair's lexicon. No, it's labor, yeah, it's well, yeah, so I mean, but it's a, uh, I guess, the last time that was muttered, uh, would have been, I guess, in the in the the context of in the context of blair mm. so by actually instead of yeah, of course exactly reappropriating the lexicon now granted that's not as far off in one direction as the far right but i mean it's to reappropriate that in the sense of a much more radical shift away from i guess you know conservative labor very the, the very conservative static um or stagnant kind of space yeah uh, that blair left it is a step in that direction or i think at least it absolutely it's bra- it's shaking that um thing up like the, the discursive or the rhetorical film of the party um you know is is an, is a floating signifier i guess and um and whatever empty signifiers that came with either blair or corbin uh to hegemonize um, whatever resources needed to get to the point where they got to determine or over-determine those floating signifiers for other people. Mm. So that, that I think that was the process there, uh, and, and which is essentially reappropriating things effectively. And I mean, that's it's the exact same process that you were talking about with uh, Make America Great Again um, in the first chat except just with one person doing the um in, in the place of the empty signifier the master signifier and its interpretation sort of free floating below that it be um presenting it as a as a floating signifier not needing to determine it because the master signifier is already in a hegemonic situation that um with so much power that it it can allow the the advantage it's advantaged by the signifier being floating uh, whereas 
in this case between Blairism and Corbynism, there's a um, there's a struggle, a hegemonic struggle for the determination to not allow it be a floating signifier, but to determine its meaning. Hmm. Okay. Her final point. Political identities are effective uh, or effectively constructed um, and are multiple within the individual. Uh, identities are multiple within the individual. Um, based on the libidinal energy, uh, not rational action, but through involvement in specific forms of life. And I think that's Wittgenstein. Uh, and that's community. So, you know, our, this is this is why this is the importance of grassroots actions. I think um, we 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 get to do this through contacting each other, through interaction, and through living with each other. Um, that's that's where our identities are really constructed, and and like the emotional interchange between being among one another <laughs> my voice went there being among one another um uh where passion becomes the understanding not rationale mm. she leaves it at that <laughs>